Welcome to the Big Biz Show. You want fast-talking, hard-hitting discussions on business and finance? Maybe with a barroom slant and some really salty peanuts? We're not counting calories. We're counting cash. Before we get to the man with the financial plan, meet the money team, Costa, Mary, and Greg. Now, Captain Finance himself, Sully. That's right, from the Loft 100 Studios in beautiful, sunny Southern California, it is the Big Biz Show. Wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening, we thank you for being along for the ride. I'm Costa. That is our executive producer, Mr. Greg Todorov, and of course, Captain Finance himself. Yeah, that's it. Hey, um, um, did you see uh, Did you see my Phillies? Damn. Clinch not only the division. Come on. Wait, wait, wait. Let's back up here. Your Phillies. What happened to your Padres? I never were my Padres. I was a Philly fan ever since I was a little kid. What? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, my two favorite teams were the St. Louis, I beg your pardon, the uh, Cincinnati Reds. Oh, yeah. And the Big Phillies. Red Machine. Big yeah. Red Machine. And then, of course, uh, of course, the uh, uh, Roberto Clemente years. Uh, the Pirates? The Pirates. Sure. Matt, oh, yeah. Look at Matt. Look at Matt. Yeah. Pot- just popped right up. there. Just like that. Gearing up yeah. over there. Um, but, yeah, Phillies. Come on. Let's, let's face it. We'll get, we'll get some Phillies people. On the air, I hope so. Uh, with us, and then absolutely, I, I was at a Padre game uh, in really good seats on Sunday for the last home game. Okay, White Sox played. Uh, That's a good team. Yeah, fourteen people showed up to their last. Home game. <laughs> fourteen people, Matt. Fourteen people. Yeah, showed up to their yeah. Matt. Matt. Matt uh, Chess is our chief of the boat here uh, with uh, deals with all the minions. Yeah, but he uh, fourteen people showed up to stay. White Sox. Look. It's not Comiskey. It's Comiss me. Yeah. <laughs> These are the Black Sox. These are the Chicago Black Sox, the ones that cheated away in the World Series. Same exactly. team back in the twenties. They right? need to get back to that. So, so if if you were if you could pick the four teams that you never need to see again, oh, um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's got to be uh, White Sox. White Sox. I mean, there are some teams that you're just well, like. No, no, eh. let me, no, let me change it. Let me change it. Four teams I never want to see again: Diamondbacks, Dodgers. Um, uh, uh, Yankees. Sure. Rockies. Yankees. Yankees. Rockies. You're not going to throw yeah. the Astros in there? No, I like, that whole I like the Astros. I like, After that whole I like the Astros because their stadium's got the best food in the planet. It's a little dated. A little bit. The, uh, the, 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 little, the little choo-choo train with the oranges in it. Yeah, it the made. food in there is amazing. Well, they had the best unis of all time also. Oh, come However, on. Actually, the Pirates did with their short pants. Just saying. Uh, that's true. <laughs> short yeah. pants. Well, remember, oh, speaking of the White Sox, remember when the White Sox went with that, like, the softball? Look, it, yes. it was like a smock. Yes, yes it was a smock. And then yeah. kind of some sh- yeah. Those are kids. So, so, yeah. I, so the Pirates were wearing shorts and high socks. Oh, you know, yeah, they with were. With the stirrups painted on the side of the socks. But remember the Pirates went to the old, like, uh, Matty, was there a name for that hat? Like the stovetop hat with the stripes? Right, with, the, with the ring around it? Yeah. The ring around it type of which thing. Which was yeah. the original hat. for. Yeah, right. Which 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 the original hat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was um, so. And the reason we're talking about this because because we're getting into the business. We're here. This is a baseball. Season. Last week of uh, the regular season. Yeah. Well, what's interesting here is is I got my strip of season tickets for for postseason. Okay. Okay. It, and what they do is they say this is how much it's going to Major League Baseball sets the prices. By the way. Okay. Oh, geez. So this so is the for the divisional up. divisional series. Um, what's the next championship series? Championship series, and then it, there's, no. There, Wild card divisional. Wild, wild card divisional. Yeah, wild card divisional championship series. Yeah. Then World Series. Oh, I don't even want to ask. Eighteen thousand dollars for two seats, all the way through. Eighteen grand. I said, hey, uh, I'll just buy them one at a time. Actually, wow. actually, I may buy them and just sell them. Oh, well, I think because yeah, I because because I remember last time. Um, I mean, it just depends what the Padres. I, I don't have. Then we're talking about Padres. I have Padres. Okay, but if you you've got Padres season tickets down at Petco downtown in in San Diego. If they make the World Series, you've got the Wonka Golden Ticket. Yeah, totally. You, you, you can get firstborn for those. Yep, yeah, for sure. Well, but they, here's the problem: is what happens when you have you have season tickets. Let's say, let's say have good season tickets on the plaza level on the first baseline. Okay, yeah. which yeah. is not which is not the field; it's the next one up. Okay, I've sitted in those before. Yes, which mm-hmm. is which is which are, which are really good seats. Mm-hmm. They don't let you sit in those seats for this trip. They give you something similar, but Major League Baseball keeps the best seats for themselves. Isn't that called like a monopoly? A racket. Uh, yeah, a racket. It's called the MLB, just like the NFL. Ching, ching, exactly. Ching. Make Howie, Fon- Howie Font's coming up next. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the after party after the interest rate cut. What are we going to take a look at here coming up? And uh, how's inflation doing? How's the stock market doing? Big Biz Show. Harry Bird God will be back with us next week. In the meantime, it's the Boys Club. Ah, yes, the 
dulcet tones of the DTT bringing us back to the Big Biz Show. Wherever you're watching, wherever you are listening, thank you as always for being along for the ride. I am Mike Costa, better known as Costa. That's Greg Todorov. Of course, there's Sully behind the bar. Big hello to the DTC. Hey, hey. Yes. Actually, it's a DTT. DTT. Yep. Mark Hattersley in today for James East, uh, who's, where is J James? Is, is in the Midwest doing something? Is he? Yeah, he is. Touring, he's, is he touring with, who's he touring? He's touring with, uh, uh, what is it? Who's the Mark Knopfler band? Dire Straits. I think he's tired of Dire Straits. Is he really? I think so. He was That's playing. awesome. I think he, he said he was. I don't know. Maybe I could be lying. I got, I got <laughs> Nick looks ring with this. Look at the looks I'm getting from the band. I was like, uh, <laughs> James. I want my James MTV. Too. Remember Perfect. that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Speaking of Superman, wouldn't. Howie Font joins us from New York City. The punk entrepreneur, otherwise known as Crash. <laughs> Not gonna live that down, am I? Oh, you should see the aftermath. I'm totally kidding. How are you, Howie? Good to see you. So, so can we talk interest rates real quick? Um, before we get to uh, before we get to the real after party, um, I, I think I think we have to, right? We've been talking about it for months and months and months, and now that it's here, exactly what we said was going to happen is going to happen. But it happened, so let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, so so, so at, how significant was it in your opinion? Well, it is significant because um, it's fifty. I, I it's, 50 it's fifty. It's a half of a percentage point. It's not a half a point. It's a half a percentage point. It's fifty basis points. Right. So okay. it goes from so, uh, goes from what five two to four nine or five three to four nine or something like that. So we were at five and a quarter, five point uh, two five, and yeah. now we're at four point seven five. There you go. All um, right. But what's really important is actually not that the amount that they cut, although that is important. They chose to cut fifty instead of just a quarter, but it's the flip. So we were raising, we were holding, and now we're going down. Um, so now that that cycle has stopped, this isn't chop wishy washy like stocks. This is up or down or flat, uh, and they don't really go jump back and forth. So we're going to expect rates probably to go down another seventy five, and they'll probably hold there. So that's a total of one and a quarter um, percent mm -hmm. down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 the, the interesting part of this is don't get me wrong, this is not all a good thing because passbook savers like seniors mm -hmm. are getting less on their money now, okay? Um, uh, people that are on fixed incomes, it hurts. Uh, it helps us in the credit card department, it helps us in the auto de department. It doesn't help us in the mortgage department yet because the mortgage rates follow the long bond, but yeah. that'll help eventually. You're gonna see mortgages in the next 18 months float back down to those twos and threes again, if this is the if this goes. But is, now, isn't this also the indicator that we're probably gonna go into a recession or we're, we're, we're heading there? I keep on hearing that on TV. No, recession means three consecutive quarters of GDP decline growth. We had a recession, if that's the case, and we had one right the second uh, second uh, month or second quarter of, of Joe Biden's term. So okay. the traditional definition of recession has been that forever, and, and they have changed it. This administration has changed the definition. Well, you don't know you're out of a recession or when it starts or ends until, you, until it's over. Okay. You have, to, you have to be able to look back. So dropping interest rates, look, at the, the Fed has three jobs, right, Howie? Maximum employment, stable right. pricing, low interest rates. That's right, it's right yeah. on the website. The problem is it's a, it's a dance. You know, it's, they, you got to feather one thing. You know, we've got a hot labor, we, we got a, we got a hot uh, uh, mortgage news. We've got a labor market that's kind of iffy. And then we've got prices that continue to, to wane on us. So... That's the scary part. Talk about the market, though, Howie, because you and I always say you got to have money at risk. And uh, uh, as you say, if you participated in the market while it was open for the last 30 years, you'd be up about 13%. You say only 13%. 13% is a pretty good number. Talk about that a little bit. Well, 13% over, over 30 years total, not annually. Oh, okay. So that, um, that, yeah, that's, so it, that's not, it's not amazing. 13% annualized is actually what you have gotten if you've held the S&P annually for the last uh, 10 years. So that would be a great return on an annual basis. But what I'm talking about it, by the after party is when you look at um, when stocks move the most and when the largest stocks move the most, it's after hours, after earnings, the institutions are getting in on that action, but you only get on it if you're holding overnight. Right. So if you were to just own the market, if you were to buy every morning and sell every um, day at the close and didn't pay any taxes, you're making 13%. So what's happening day to day in the market really isn't that important. What's happening are these big jumps that are happening on overnight announcements. And I just thought that was a really interesting fact 
going to. So how do you, so if you're not a guy that let's say you're Mike Costa who puts his money with a with with his wife who puts his money with a with a money manager and doesn't look at the market all day long like you and I do, how does how does someone navigate something like that? Well, it doesn't it doesn't change the practical advice, but I think it reinforces it in a really important way. Day trading, if you're just participating up and down uh, in the day and you're done at four, you're, there's not that much to, to gain from it. What Mike and other people should be doing is holding long term and you know when you have enough assets, have somebody help you, help you management. Uh, until then, ETFs are a great solution. What about uh, how, how, how does this tie into, how does this affect uh, that really fun I word, inflation? Yeah, so when we, when we speak about inflation, um, it, we've had a big period of it for the last four years yeah. where you know, the market, the dollar's value has gone down in aggregate about 20%. That's huge. But it's been happening all the time. Even at 2%, it over a period of 30 years, it's going to compound quite a bit. So if you were holding that money in the S&P just during the day, making that 13%, that's in, that's in nominal terms. When you put inflation into it and you get real terms, your purchasing power has gone down by more than half, like 53%. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that's and that's that's for real Americans. I mean, that, that that's that's yeah. what you're talking about in terms of of of, um, of when you look at the CPI that strips out food and uh, strips out groceries and gas. What the hell's the what the hell's the CPI number all about then? If you're not if you're stripping out the most two most volatile items, the ones that you spend the most money on. And by the way, groceries and gas, in my opinion, are a tax. You have to pay it. You can't not go to uh, go to work. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't starve. No. It is basically yeah. a tax, and when your tax has gone up fifty percent, <laughs> which is basically what you see, you know, look at if your if your buying power is down fifty percent, it means the tax went up fifty percent, right? Right. That's it. So where do we go from here, Howie? Uh, with, with respect to, uh, to to the next steps here, are we going to are we going to see rapid inflation decreases? The election have anything to do with it? Is it is, is it buying the rumor, selling the news? How, how does this all look shake out? Well, well, the Fed's cut. The Fed has cut uh, fifty basis points in part as a bet that inflation is going to stay about where it is or go down even a little bit lower, but they need to act on the jobs uh, market. Yeah. So since we see the jobs market weakening, they are trying to stimulate the economy now and they think it's safe uh, inflation wise. That is still yet to be seen how correct the Fed's going to end up right now. Inflation is at about 2.2. But if it spikes again, the Fed's in a real bind and then the economy does, kind of doesn't know what to do all at once. As far as the election, we only have about two months. I think they can weave this through without uh, getting the news or getting the results. The numbers take so long to, you know, get updated. So, so how are you guys feeling when you go to the grocery store? When you take, you got, you guys both have, you got family. You got mm -hmm. two kids, and you're out to dinner, and you're out to grocery store. You got, uh, you got your dinks, double income, no kids at home, really. Right. Uh, yeah. So, what's what does it feel like out there? I, you know what? I went to Home Depot the other day. Yeah. I feel like there is some gouging going on. Do you I, really? I do. I you feel like, like you there mean, are some things. I mean, not just inflation. Not just inflation. There are some things that are priced at a level that when you compare them to, say, a year ago or two years ago, you mm -hmm. know, because I saved my receipts, guys. Of course. Um, he does. <laughs> he does. Yeah. He irons his Oh, man. And he saves his receipts. So... You go back and look. What were you buying? A year ago. Oh, those those salt ta tablets for your water softener. You know, I oh, hate soft okay. water. Right? Yeah, Feels like you can't get the soap. Well, off. Wait, well, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But anyway, oh, so you got to do it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I'm getting these salt. I literally was paying like three seventy five a bag. Yeah. Two years ago. Yeah. You know what I'm paying right now? What? You know what I just paid? What? Eight fifty. See. Son that's of a not inflation. So they're you. It's so, not inflation. So they're salt tablets. Did the price of salt really go <laughs> up? Like, let's be honest here. I was just thinking. I was thinking. It's so funny. I was thinking about the movie. I was so hungry yesterday. I was eating over the sink. Uh, that's 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 how a bachelor. Oh. That's how a bachelor eats salad. Takes a piece of lettuce and some, and some salad. I just eat some. I was thinking. Remember the movie Castaway? And I was thinking. It's so funny you bring up salt. I was thinking. Boy, remember when he finally discovered fire and he was eating lobster? Oh my God. And he go, God, I need some salt. I figured, well, he, this, I was thinking yesterday, how do you make salt? That's cheap. Yeah. yeah. And you bring up that. Yeah. Do you know much. what the inflation? Well, what about for you guys? Is is it is it? I, I, uh, uh, yeah. Now you know because we have the 253 month old who's taken a gap year, so we're feeding him. Month old. Um, <laughs> like you know, I went to I, I went to I, we buy our bagels. Yeah. From Vons. Yeah. 
Um, dozen bagels is fourteen dollars. What? Yeah, two bucks a bagel. Yeah. And normally, and, and, well, you can get a bagel sandwich for fourteen dollars at a bagel place. <laughs> thank you. Exactly, exactly what I was going to say. So, but I feel normally that's like six or seven dollars. Yeah, isn't is there any more delicious than uh, cream cheese with chives in it? Oh, make your own, by the oh. way. I, this my new deal is you get the whipped cream cheese and you get some chives, oh, yeah. chop it up. You make, yeah. you got it, but you got to take uh, some uh, some nonstick spray on your spatula when you scoop it out. What kind of bagel do you go with it? Everything? Everything. Oh yeah. Or a jalapeno. Jalapeno with, cheddar. Yeah with, the, with, with, yeah, with the four pounds of cheese on top and, and jalapenos, is that right? I I'm going to talk to you about shadow inflation here in a minute. Also, uh -oh. Todd Rampey, Wealth Builders Institute, one of Mike's uh, finds here. We'll see how that goes coming up. Looking forward to having him. Big Biz Show, see you in a minute. It is the Big Biz Show. We are in the Loft 100 Studios here in sunny Southern California. As always, we appreciate you being along for this wacky, crazy ride with these wacky, crazy kids, including me, Greg Todorov. And what is it, Captain Underpants or Captain Finance? Yeah, Sully. Captain Finance. <laughs> you have those books? Oh, of course. Hey, see today, 125 million TV homes strong. Let's not forget Bloomberg El Financiero in Mexico, another 15 million homes there. Soon to be in Bloomberg EU. Can't quite get to the Bloomberg uh, primetime in the Baby US. steps. That's gonna... They're lost. Uh, Dan Negroni's here. Dan, great to see you, buddy. Dan Negroni. Hello, everybody. CEO, coach, consultant, chief launch officer for, uh, for DanNegroni.com. And of course, Dan's been a friend of mine for a long time. Dan was a friend of mine when I was a taco shy of 330 pounds. Oof. Get out of here. I was in a spin class. And what happens when you're riding a bike uh, when you're that big, your legs go like this. Your legs don't go like this. So, you go, so I was in a spin class. Dan, you know, this up is in the front row. true story. Dan's in the front row, and, I, and the reason I was in the back bike and the very bike because I could see the clock there. I'm looking okay, in the mirror. All I have to do is play 15 minutes. Um, I was talking to somebody last night, literally last night, about uh, to go to college, not to go to college, and, and, and I didn't really realize what you were coming to talk about today. Um, yeah, I uh, just wrote a blog on it literally I know. last week, and I just it's just and maybe that it was in the back of my mind because I read your blog about it, and I thought to myself. Okay, it's a, it is a hundred fifty thousand uh, uh, dollar contemplation minimum, probably. right? If it's lucky per, per kid and for a kid, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking, well, if I were to do it over again with all of my children, and, and look at, I got one, one's a doctor, one's a senior graphic designer, both of them killing it. I couldn't be happier. However, they both would have done the same thing had they gone to junior college for two years, and transferred and had a cup of coffee at Harvard, Stanford, or one, any of the schools. The other thing I was thinking is, why aren't we spending enough time talking about how to mitigate those costs, like? I'd like to start a company where you buy, where you sell condos to freshmen, and then you use the then you use the upside after four years to help pay for the tuition. Whether it's twenty thousand bucks, hundred thousand bucks, I mean, the real estate typically will go up in the right markets. You couldn't do it in every market, but Dan, to go to college, not go to college. What's Gen Z saying right now? I think they're they're asking the question, which they never asked before. Yeah. Everyone said, you know, when I grew up, your parents said, you need an education, you must go to college. Right. And I think the really great thing about college is not the learning, because you're not learning, you're having experiences, right? Yeah. And those are your life skills. They're not teaching you in class. Right. I mean, the professors, I shouldn't say it now that I'm a college professor, <laughs> but you look around and um, it's just very rote. Yeah. Is there anything you see in a book you could read, you could watch videos on. It's almost like, it's almost like, like what was the movie with Ben Affleck and, uh, and, and Matt Damon, the uh, Goodwill, Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting, where he, where he yeah. says in the bar, he goes, look, half the stuff you're doing, I could read in the public library for $30 in late charges. By the way, Dan is... just click for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Dan, you, you, are a, you are the next-gen uh, management and, and, and talent development consultant. And, and when we first got together on the air eight years ago or better, um, you were talking about um, you were talking about millennials yeah. and, and and such. Is the millennial they're all grown up? And yeah, they are. Kids. So is the Gen Z, Gen Y, and I don't think we start over again. Gen Y is millennials, okay. same thing. Okay, Gen so, X, right? So yeah. So what's the boomers? Next? Gen X. What is Gen is, y is the mentality moving in the direction you thought it was going to move in, or, or 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 are these Gen Xers moving into baby boomer uh, thought processes and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think that. The question really was, how much is tech going to change the future generations? Yeah, right. mm -hmm. And I think you see with Gen Zs that has changed more than millennials because what happened, I think, in 2010 was the iPhone, right, from flip phone 
your computer in your pocket right, everywhere sure. you are. Yeah. And this rewiring of America happened mostly to Gen Zs. Millennials were old enough that they had experienced life, they had done a lot of free play, they had learned a lot of real things, and Gen Z has grown up in the silo of this, this screen. Well, what's inter- and what's interesting too is interesting to think that you know, 2010, 2012, the word iPhone wasn't even our lexicon. Right, isn't that crazy? It wasn't even our lexicon. Yeah, it's only 12 years ago. When when you talk about technology, and the reason I say this is because I remember as you were saying this, uh, we had kids sim- similar age. Yeah. And I see my daughters now who are close to 30 years old who were never going to buy a house, didn't care about those things, didn't care about, uh, uh, only cared about you know taking care of the people. Uh, versus taking care of themselves. Now suddenly they're looking at buying houses. Yeah, they've they're saying I'm not. They're, they're bone business. I'm not paying that guy 16 bucks an hour. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's funny how you only get perspective. Their minimum so, wage is 20. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's only. It's funny how you get perspective when you sign the front of a paycheck exactly. versus the back of a paycheck. What's the mindset now? Um, is, does the mindset change you know, automatically? I, for sure, right? Like adulthood, they grow up and they they want to achieve things. They want, and the world is very expensive now. Yeah. Um, and so it's harder for them to buy homes in particular areas. Right. right? You could go to the middle of the country and probably still um, buy a house yeah. with without, respect to what it's here. Without mortgaging basically. your parents' house right, to with, get it. Basically, yeah. or without borrowing, you know, kids are borrowing right. 200, 300, 500 grand from their parents to get into homes and interest rates are higher. And so it's a problem. But I think, the, you know, the biggest challenge is will this, millennials, have adulted and they want homes. Gen Zs are trying to figure out who they want to be and um, they're a little bit delayed by the phone. Sure. They haven't had real interaction. Okay, so I, as I tell everybody on the show, I've, and I think I've told you this before, I've got a 253 month old, I'm living, I'm living with in my house. <laughs> and is, is it wrong for, I'll, I'll be 60 in November. Is it wrong for me to continually tell him, dude, get your nose out of your phone, smell a rose, go roll in the dirt, Play with your Tonka trucks. Or are we past that? Are, are we, is that wrong? Is so, it because they're just... Well, for sure, you know it's not wrong. It's the complete right answer that we all did. Yeah. The question is, well, you know, Does what, it why didn't we do it 10 years yeah, ago? Parents and tell us to go outside years. our whole lives. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, we weren't keeping them away from video games. We weren't limiting their screen time. We weren't saying you couldn't have social media until you were 16 years old. And it's created a real challenge. And so now we have to go back. Truth is, the world is safer today than it's ever been. So don't don't go out and play and your parents watching you for every minute when when our kids grew up versus when we grew up this like see at five we were doing jumps, right? yeah. Yeah. We were doing yeah. jumps on our big wheels at so, five years old with a bb gun yep. Yeah. Yep. so this whole safetyism has affected them and yeah. they're they're scared and so they're really smart once you get them trained they really want to do good in the world they have a ton of tolerance but they don't know how to initiate, is what the studies show. Two questions. They don't know how to start. Two questions. The study you're talking about is is the the, the study done in Marley in Australia, yes. which which, Gen Z. which which is being published October fourth. And you're teaching this in college right now. Well, I'm teaching Gen Zs, and I am using the study and the teaching to confirm that my experience is correct <laughs> and that the study is correct, and it is correct. So, so here's my question: You had a great. You had a great. Uh, sort of philosophy when you first started in the millennial uh, uh, education, sort of uh, teaching us about millennials and teaching business. There was the millennial side of things, and this is how you have to act in business. But then there was the business side of things. This is how you have to deal, deal with your workforce. Yeah. How are we doing as the other side of Gen Z uh, on dealing with their new Yeah, paradigm? when I wrote the book, I, I wrote in it, Next Generation Leaders, and it required both sides to change, to your point. And I think we've done a better job of changing mm-hmm than we've done of being able to mentor and teach them to change. <laughs> so we were like, more malleable than they were. Well, we were malleable, but we're not really good at coaching and at, right, like letting someone solve a problem instead of come to us. Give you an example. I give the class a bunch of assignments to do a presentation on strategy, yeah. and they want a guidebook. And I say, <laughs> this is strategy. There is no guidebook for right. strategy. Yeah. And now you have the internet. You don't have to go rip out pages from an encyclopedia like we did, right? Or yeah. go to the library. You can actually figure it all out. And so stop asking me for a guidebook and start asking questions. Dan Negroni for president. We need to get you in there every week. You are invited every week. Okay. As long as you Thank want to come in. DanNegroni.com. DanNegroni.com. The quintessential next generation uh, talent development consultant. And of course, what school are you teaching? Are you going to be touring? Uh, Cal State San Marcos. Cal State San yeah, Marcos. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you should come. Well, you get we, should, we, should, we should do a, uh, we should oh, do a live be show. Fun. From your, that would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, They'd Dan, love that. More of this coming up. It is 
time for the uh, Sports Biz Minute, brought to you, as always, by the great people at Price Picks, the number one largest daily fantasy platform up there. Simply sign up at pricepicks.com. Uh, Sully Grug, we're going to start off in college football. Uh, USC Heisman Trophy winner Reggie Bush has filed a lawsuit against the school, along with the Pac-12 and NCAA, over past use of his name, image, and likeness without compensation. This is now becoming a trend. Back in June, members of the championship-winning North Carolina State men's basketball team uh, from 82-83 sued the NCAA and the collegiate licensing company over their long-standing usage of their you know, NIL. This is like going back to high school and suing them for not paying you to play pro football. Well, well, at, at what point, Sully, is the cutoff? Or the statute well, of limitations I think it's, run it's, out? It's cut off when the, everything before NIL is the cutoff. Yeah. When they gave name and likeness rights, to, right. uh, to collegiate athletes. Exactly. That's the day it starts. Nothing before. You can't do it now. No. If, if these pictures and photographs and, and likenesses were happened after the NAL decision by the NCAA, right. then you do it. Otherwise, you can't go back and stuff the genie back in the bottle. Nope. Uh, speaking of uh, college football, 6.3 million tuned in for USC's first ever Big Ten matchup this past Saturday in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which CBS says is their most watched week four game in 10 years, higher than Ole Miss Alabama last year. Uh, this Saturday's tilt with number two Georgia visiting number four Alabama should also draw huge numbers as well. Once again, proving Sully and Greg that the SEC is king in, uh, in college I, football. You know, what made Michigan fun to watch the last couple of years was Harbaugh. Oh, totally. I mean, so I don't even know who the coach is anymore. I'm not sure. I think I need to find another team uh, other than the Chargers. <laughs> um, what, There's a lot out there. Who is, who, who's coaching? Do you even know the coach? The Michigan? defensive coordinator is the guy who got the position yep. uh, when Jim Harbaugh you know left. His and I his name, name. Greg, yeah. I, it. Any other professional NFL athletes or coaches now coaching college? Uh, yeah, we saw Pete, uh, what's his name, up in uh, – well, Deion Sanders is the head coach of the University of Colorado. Okay, there you go. Anybody else? Had to turn that program around. Um, maybe, maybe that's when we follow from now on. With uh, Deshaun Foster, who was a uh, Carolina Panther as a player, he's coach, uh, head coach at UCLA. So, I want to see uh, Bruce Bochy go from football or from baseball to college football and see how that works out for him. The guy, I, th- I think the, I think the guy. I think you know how clubs. big that helmet would be? Oh my God, he's the, he's got this head <laughs> the size of a planet. What else you got? Uh, finally, uh, the roast of Tom Brady was a big winner among sports programming on Netflix during their first half of the year in terms of global views. Brady's special not only outperformed all sports titles on Netflix from January through June, but it was also number 26th among all Netflix programs. We're talking genre, any language in terms of views. And the show wasn't even offered globally. Now, I don't know if that's the reach of Netflix or the fact that it's, it's Tom Brady, who's a, you know, obviously he's known the world. He looks over. like a Kardashian. I mean, like literally like when the Kardashians cut their hair. He's looking a little. Uh, yeah, how much work has he had done at this point? I mean, he was a handsome SOB in the first Put place. Put it this way. Another facelift will have a permanent goatee. If you know what I mean. <laughs> that's the Sports Biz Minute. It's brought to you by Prize Picks. Largest daily fantasy platform out there. It's very simple. Sign up at prizepicks.com. Once again, there you go. here's Sully. All righty. I will tell you. <laughs> okay, that was a, that was a time released joke. There you go. <laughs> Richard Stockton is the president and CEO of a company called Bramer Hotels and Resorts. We've had him on the air before. Fantastic guy, Richard. Great to talk to you again, man. How are you, sir? Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. happy to uh, host you as a VIP whenever you like, Sully. You, you let me know. We need. Do we need to do this? We need to go do it. Bring a big biz show to go out there and do a show at your at your property yeah. on location. I agree. On location. Yeah. Hey, talk to us. Um, uh, about the hotel market these days, it's interesting because COVID changed everything for everybody, uh, especially hospitality. I see as open air indicators, as I love to do three day trips, that's my deal. If I leave on a Thursday, come back on a Sunday, it makes me really happy. Thursday night to Sunday. Yep. Um, I'm seeing it more difficult, unless I've got a dude in the business like Richard, to get a room, to, to get it in a decent hotel. Is, it, is, it, is that an open air indicator say you guys are getting busier or is that just because we live in Southern California here? You know, rates are way up. And uh, there's a recent report that came out, maybe you saw, which said that the number of hotels in the U.S. that are charging $1,000 a night has quadrupled uh, this year, year to date, relative to five years ago before the pandemic, 2019. Uh, so, so rates have gone up and, and they've gone up a little bit unevenly. You know, if you are looking at resorts, particularly luxury resorts, mm-hmm. uh, average daily rates will be up over 50 percent uh, from five years ago, uh, whereas on the urban side, 
Uh, they're up, but not quite as much. Uh, and in both cases, occupancies are still a little bit lower than where we were five years ago. Richard, talk uh, about t- talk about your properties specifically, because if you go to the website, um, it's 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 really interesting because you've got some really unique properties there. But talk about your business in in, in total for people who've not heard of uh, the Braemar Hotels and Resorts. Yeah, so Braemar is a lodging REIT that specializes in owning luxury hotels and resorts. Uh, we have a number of the uh, hotels managed by major brands. We have a number of Ritz-Carlton's. So say Ritz-Carlton Lake Tahoe, Ritz-Carlton Sarasota, Ritz-Carlton St. Thomas, Ritz-Carlton Reserve, Dorado Beach in Puerto Rico. Uh, we've got a Park Hyatt in Beaver Creek. We have a Four Seasons in Scottsdale. Wow. So we focus on that luxury end of the hotel spectrum because we believe that over the long term, luxury hotels have higher barriers to entry. It's much more complicated to build a luxury hotel as as competing supply. It's more difficult to finance. It takes a lot more time, a lot more resources. Uh, So that that has some built-in protections to the inventory. And that's why we were in the luxury space. Can I I ask you, uh, you know, the Fed Reserve just dropped interest rates uh, half a percentage point, um, which brought us down to the 4.7 range. Uh, It's supposed to trickle into inflation, obviously. Does that affect your business? Does it affect the hotel business at all? Yeah, it affects us in two ways. It affects us on the top line and it affects us on what I'd say on the balance sheet. Uh, you know, Clearly, we're starting to see in the hotel business uh, some early signs of a, uh, of a of economy that's getting a little tighter. And I think the Fed has kept interest rates high enough for just enough time to start to see that. You start to see unemployment ticking up. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of a pullback in demand for hotel room nights. So that's kind of the one thing. So this this interest rate cut is a welcome relief. We want to put more cash into people's pockets so they can stay at our hotels. But then also from a balance sheet perspective, you know, we finance our properties with primarily floating rate debt. And so we saw our interest expense triple yeah. when rates went up. But, but you know, but, but, but doing non-dilutive de- debt like that versus equity is a smart play. And it's a little bit of a gamble sometimes when, when these things happen. But uh, this is good news for you eventually here because obviously mortgage rates and interest rates follow those type of interest rates follow the long bond. It's, and it's gonna, it only, only uh, you can extrapolate the fact you'll probably be doing pretty, a lot better on the bottom line. Yeah, and we, we use about 40% of our uh, debt, so net debt to gross assets, we call it. Uh, which we think is a nice conservative level of leverage. You know, you want to um, you know use as much debt as you can without putting the company at risk. And so we believe that in the hotel business, because it does go through cycles and it does experience some volatility at times, you don't want to go really any higher than that. In fact, over time, we might come even lower. And a lot of our, our peers have even less debt than that. Um, and, you know, and debt's expensive right now, so there's not a lot of benefit to taking on that incremental risk. I want to ask a question. Typically, in a hotel arrangement, I've interviewed a number over the years, but not a lot. Isn't there an owner of the property and then they're, and then they insert an operator? So in other words, uh, we own a lot on the beach and then Four Seasons comes in and operates. Is that, is that, is that how you guys operate as well? Or do you just buy the whole lock, stock and barrel uh, along with the, uh, the, the operating agreement that's in place? Yeah, it's probably the biggest misconception um, for the man on the street about the hotel business is that when you drive down the highway and you see a Marriott, you say, oh, that's owned by Marriott. That hotel's owned by Marriott. It's typically not. It's typically owned by a real estate investor that owns a bricks and mortar. And then the real estate investor will potentially hire Marriott to manage it, but then also brand it. But sometimes hire a different manager entirely, a company that you've never heard of, Mm -hmm. to provide all the employees to manage the hotel and then do a franchise arrangement to put the brand on the hotel. So it can be up to three parties involved in uh, a hotel, uh, as you see it uh, in the market. When did you guys acquire Scottsdale uh, Four Seasons? Uh, it was uh, December two years ago. Yeah, uh, it's been a fantastic. I'm glad you did because I went in July four years ago, and I swear <laughs> I thought I was at a Hampton Inn. <laughs> I, no, I love Four Seasons. Yes, but when you're walking around the pool and there's uh, empty chili dog plates nah, on the coping, nah, I mean, nah. I, 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 when I saw this, you know, there's, I'm glad they did the acquisition because it makes all the difference in the world sometimes how they operate and who the manager is. You are a publicly traded company, Richard, uh, and I know you can only say so much, but and we'd love to have you back in the air again on a regular basis. Um, next 18 months for you, in as much as you can, as, as you can detail, yeah. what are you looking forward to and what do you think is going to happen mm-hmm. with, with your company? Well, I, I could talk you know, very freely about what the industry is, is looking forward to, and I think it's similar for us, is you know, we are in a period of, of where capital is constrained because interest rates have been so high. So 
as a result, there's not a lot of supply of new hotels coming into the market. The, the supply this year of new hotels is about half a percent of the existing inventory. That compares with about 2% per year historically. Mm -hmm. So when we have less hotel rooms being added for the existing owners of hotels, that's mm -hmm. good yeah. because there's uh, more scarcity and therefore you know, our rates should go higher. And we're seeing that more particularly in the end that is full service and luxury where we operate uh, versus the economy side. And so, you know, that should be the the seg those should be the segments that benefit most in the next couple of years. I think uh, I think we'd like to have you come in studio and maybe we, we do a big big show to go with. Uh, I think so. A uh, tour of all of the properties, if I'm not mistaken. Be nice. Hey, Richard, want to have you Good. back? Thanks, brother. Richard Stockton is his name. President and CEO Bramer Hotels and Resorts BHR. You can go to bhrreit.com. Reit as in real estate investment trust. bhrreit.com. And there you go. I think we start at the Park Hyatt Beaver Creek. Another beautiful day inside the Loft 100 Studios in Southern California. Beautiful because of two things. The Big Biz Show is on the air. And number two, you are with us. Us being Costa, Greg Tonerov, and Sully. There you go. Hey, Taylor Trio today. Good to see you, boys. Oh, yeah. Um, have you discovered pickleball? Oh, yeah. Are you a pickleball fanatic? Uh, I'm not a fanatic, but we have a portable net uh, that we roll out into the street and play. Oh, wow. Once in a while. Wow. Yeah. Street pickleball. That's yeah. like street football. You got skin knees and stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Look out for the bumper. Go down the, go to the Rambler. Take a... Uh, uh, take, yeah. Um, Greg, and I, Greg and I played pickleball together the other day. We are... I would argue that... Um, so my day starts so early, like three thirty or four thirty. Okay. But by the time seven a.m. comes, you're out. I can take a little break, yeah. of course. So I can play lunch. pickleball almost every day. I figured out last week I played twelve hours of pickleball. I played three on Saturday, three on Sunday. Get out of here! And then I played. So there's six, and then I played every single day. You know, for a little over an hour in the morning at seven o'clock. Are you going to a residence or a club to play? We're or? in a club. Nice. But uh, so Greg came out, and it's it's. I mean, it is addicting. And and yes, it is. It is. Greg and I are forming a team. Yep. Um, with Matt, we're going to three, three, three. Uh, we're going we're to play threes instead of uh, instead of uh, three pickles, double, double, six balls. Three pickles, six balls. Nice. Yeah. Which is we're also the name of a. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you do, the, name, like, the name of our new totally game. Stole, you totally stole my thing. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I was struggling doing the math. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Uh, by the way, so we have a great partnership with Taylor Guitar. Taylor Guitar has uh, uh, named me and James, a couple of featured artists uh, for uh, Taylor Guitars, of course, an unbelievable guitar company that has uh, everyone from Sting to... Uh, Paul McCartney playing their guitars. Um, they are doing an unbelievable uh, uh, charity uh, for for uh, a group called Guitars for Vets. And what they're doing is they've they've teamed up with a watch company that that takes remnant wood from the guitars, makes watches out of them. Oh, love that! And a percentage of the sales goes to GuitarsForVets.org. PTSD is a big piece of uh, of our of our daily conversation, as you well know, and helping vets cope with PTSD uh, is is now uh, is now a function of music. And uh, I'm going to bring on Nigel Fisher. Nigel Fisher is the Director of Advancement for Guitars for Vets. What a great organization. Jeez. Nigel, thanks for coming on. We had, we had a chance to talk to the guys at Taylor once again uh, uh, last week on a show. And, and I know we got an event coming up. But talk about what you guys do, because this is really interesting. When I see these videos of guys sitting in uh, an auditorium all playing guitars, and they're all, they're all vets that, that, are, that were suffering PTSD. Talk about this for a bit. Yeah, thanks for having me on today. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the mission and how we're serving veterans. So this came together 17 years ago, a partnership between a guitar instructor and a Vietnam vet. And they realized that there was a lot of joy in the camaraderie of being able to play together. So we've created that community surrounding are over 150 chapters nationwide at this point where we can share that healing power of music with veterans uh, that may be struggling with PTSD or other invisible wounds of service. Nigel, you you served, and, and as always, thank you for your service, what you do for us uh, guarding the wall for us. You were wounded in, in combat. How did you deal with that when you came back? 
Well, it was a variety of ways. Um, a lot of family support, support from those that I served with, um, but I spent a lot of time outdoors and I found that the solace of outdoors was immensely impactful, but then I needed something else to round out uh, that healing because as we know, the weather isn't always favorable 24 hours a day to sure. be able to go out and enjoy activities that we love. And the guitar is that solace for me that is available 24 hours a day and really at an arm's reach. I can reach out and connect with my guitar anytime. I think part of this, though, is it was surprising to me to think that having to deal with something as, as, as extraordinary as PTSD could be, I guess, waylaid for a minute by having to learn to play an instrument. And, and, it's, it, it, and I don't use the word distraction I, because, because um, music is much more than that. But boy, it, it, you have to concentrate so hard on learning a new instrument, specifically guitar, which I've been playing since I was eight years old. I would argue it's harder to play than piano. Uh, but I would also, every kid in the world, I would start on piano first, by the way. But long story short, talk about how that, what, what, what was the light bulb that happened when that, when that occurred? Yeah, it's, um, you know, when you pick up the guitar and you connect with it, um, you definitely go, as you said, to a different place due to that focus and attention. And you're utilizing a different part of your brain, of course, when you're engaging in artistic or creative uh, types of outlets. And so it's just really this pleasant feeling uh, when you feel a little bit of anxiety or something along those lines. And you can change that trajectory by seeking out that very positive feeling connecting with the guitar. Yeah, I think, uh, um, I think you know, you, whoever came up with it was brilliant. Talk about your upcoming event and how people can get involved. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, we've got an event October 11th that's going to be at the University Club in San Diego. Okay, so, we'll so, so for, the, for, for, our, for our national audience, anybody listening, uh, let's say in Los Angeles, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Las Vegas, or here in San Diego, uh, University Club's downtown San Diego. So you're doing an event. What time does that event start? Uh, it's going to begin at 5 p.m. Door will open for the performance at 6. Scotty Hastings uh, will be our headlining event, and I know that you're going to be joining us as well. So we're really excited for the full lineup of events that night, but really supporting our veterans and celebrating 21 of our recent graduates from our program that So night. you got 21 guys going to be playing a song or two. Uh, that just graduated. That's fantastic. I love that. The, um, can I ask you this? How can people help other than just getting involved in that? Is there, you have some unmet needs, I'm assuming. It's got to come down to money because you got the guitar thing figured out. So, so, so how can people help out and where do they go to do that? Certainly, they can come to our website, guitarsforvets.org, and they can join us as volunteers to help support through delivering guitar lessons. And as you mentioned, of course, uh, donations are always very welcome. Uh, we are a business, even though we are a nonprofit, because we've got to be able to support those resources needed to deliver the program long term for so many veterans that truly are grateful uh, for everyone's support in this effort. Nigel Fisher, Director of Advancement, Guitars for Vets. You can go to guitarsforvets.org. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Get out there and see you guys. I know the the band's going to be out there playing in the background. The top symphony towers. Well, the day trader, the day trader quattro is going to go out there. I think. Love it. Mess around. For good stuff. All right, that does it for us. We shall see you tomorrow. Big Biz Show. BigBizShow.com. See you in a minute. <laughs>